In this video, we're going to prove that we're not very creative for applications. One application of a heap is to sort things because we haven't come up with enough sorting algorithms yet. So we're going to talk about heap sort. The way we're going to do this is in a very data structures oriented way. Step one is build a heap. So all of this code up here builds a heap. Build a heap. We build that heap using the elements of the array we wish to be sorted. All of the code below that actually sorts the array. How can we analyze this? Well, we know some things about these functions. Let's try and write this down in a very generic way first. T of n, the runtime of this sorting algorithm, that first we have a for loop that goes from one to n of, we are performing a max heap insert. So I'm just gonna write that as the time it takes to insert as a function of the size of the heap, plus the sum from i equals n to one. Huh, we have a down to there, so that's a little awkward. We'll deal with this strange looking summation in a second. Of the time it takes to extract max as a function of the size of the heap, and this is a generic way to write down this runtime without filling in too many of the details. Just like we saw when we were looking at hashing, thinking about this in terms of the size of the data structure will be very helpful. There are two different ways we can approach this. One is we could observe that during the first loop, the size is equal to i, and during the second loop, the size starts at n and goes down to one. So the size should be not n to one, it should be n minus i. Does that seem to make sense? Let's double check. During the first run of the loop, it's equal to n. So this isn't quite right because we plug in i equals one, we get n minus one, so we need to do n minus i plus one. This is one way to do it. The alternative method is to reconceptualize the entire problem in terms of the sizes. So for the first loop here, we have that the size starts at one and goes to n. And during the second loop, the size starts at n and goes down to one. And this though might not look like it's helpful because it's the exact same sort of reasoning we just did, but it can be more helpful to think about the problem in this way sometimes. And we'll see this when we look at some harder problems involving these data structures. That thinking about it in terms of the size at the start and the size at the end can be a more, more helpful framework to be in. So we could alternatively, alternatively, think about size. I'm going to do that just to get us used to it. So we know the time it takes to insert as a function of the size is equal to log of s. Let's make that a little more precise and put a constant out front because it will take some constant amount of time to execute those operations. And also the time it took to extract the maximum element as a function of the size was also log of s. So this means I can express t of n as the sum from s equals one to n, where I'm now reconceptualizing this in terms of the sizes and not the indices. And then the cost of that loop is c times log of s plus the sum from s equals n down to one of c times log of s. Notice that this last summation, I will show this once and we don't need to do this in the future. This last summation here, I can write as log of n plus log of n minus one plus all the way down until log of one. If I swap the order of that summation, it's the same as log of one plus log of two plus up until log of n. Because the size is only ever changing by one, the order in which I write those terms is not going to be meaningful. So I can rewrite that second summation as the sum from s equals one to n 
of log of s. That's just rewriting the terms of the summation. And notice that these two summations are the same. So if I can analyze one of them, I can analyze both of them. So let's try and analyze that summation. The sum from s is equal to 1 to n of c times log of s. To bound this above, I'm going to take the summation and replace the value of s with the largest it ever gets because it is an increasing function of s. So this is equal to c n log of n. That's nice and easy. To bound it below, I'm going to split the summation in half and keep the second half of the terms because it is an increasing summation. We have c times log of s. I'm then going to replace s with n over 2. And I have n over 2 times c times log of n over 2. So these summations are both in theta of n because they are identical summations. So I can easily from there conclude that t of n is also in theta of n log n. Notice that this is in the worst case as well. I didn't elaborate too much on it because we didn't think too hard about what we were writing down, but these runtimes were both in best and expected case of log of n. We actually did a runtime analysis both in the expected case and the worst case because these methods have identical runtimes for their best and expected case runtimes. So we have another sorting algorithm that is in n log n in the worst case. So this is another thought to have when you might be trying to sort an array. One last comment that I'll make is that this loop here is actually in theta of n. If you do some more sophisticated probabilistic analysis and look at what typically happens for these functions. The book elaborates on this a small amount if you wish to read about it. And there are some research papers that talk about this from the 80s where they proved that in the expected case, several insertions, n insertions is in theta of n and that the expected case for each of those insertions is bounded above by a constant for several of them occurring in succession. But that is beyond the scope of this course, so we won't do anything with that here.